now for our first keynote address for today. I would like to invite Professor S.J. Olshansky, Professor of Public Health from the University of Illinois, Chicago, for his presentation on health and longevity in the 21st century. Please make him welcome. All right, um, let me first of all pull up the in initial slides. No, she fixed it. There we go. All right. Um, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, the Queensland government for bringing me here. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be here. Ironically enough, the last time I was here was exactly 17 years ago. Uh, I stayed about three kilometers from where we are today, and I was talking about uh, a manuscript that my colleagues and I had published in the New England Journal of Medicine predicting that this would be the first generation of children to live a shorter lifespan than their parents. Uh, and I remember doing all these news stories uh, f from Queensland, and the rea I'm gonna actually gonna show you what the reaction was here in Australia to that article that came out. Some of you uh, may not have remembered that, but it was a rather interesting uh, event when it, when it happened. All right, so we've got a lot to talk about small amount of time. Um, there's going to be some dosages of science here, which is a good thing if you want to understand what's going on with, uh, with human body fat. And so let's get into this. Uh, these are the issues that I'm going to talk about. Storing energy is an evolutionary adaptation. This is absolutely critical to understanding why it is that it's so hard to get rid of uh, body fat. Uh, nutrition science made a whole suite of mistakes. No offense to the nutrition scientists in the audience, but it's not anything you don't already know. Um, developmental programming uh, is critical to understanding the linkages between what happens early in life and what happens later in life. And normally I talk about aging, by the way, that's really my primary area of expertise. And so I ended up putting all of my images against the backdrop that I normally use. And it didn't occur to me until just a, you know, a minute ago when I started to think of this, that this is sort of a good example of an early life event influencing a late life event. In other words, if you take care of your skin, it doesn't have to look like, th like this when, when, when you get older. Oops, my, uh, my laser pointer is not working. So it doesn't have to look like that when you get older. There is something that you can do early that influences uh, late events and, and um, uh, and you do have control over that. And then I will address this issue very specifically about whether or not uh, we are headed towards a very unusual event, never happened in history, which is a generation of children that could in fact live longer, uh, live shorter uh, than their parents' uh, generation. I will be focusing mostly on the United States because that's what I know the best. It's actually good that, you, that I focus on the US because you can learn from all the mistakes that we've made over the last few decades. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's the reason why I'm here, is so you could hear about all the mistakes that we made and avoid them uh, uh, going forward. So let's get into this uh, issue of storing uh, energy. It's, a, it's actually a fascinating story about how this body operates and exactly how it is that we, uh, we store energy. As it turns out, energy storage is an evolutionary adaptation. It's common among almost all forms of life. We want this to happen. We want to store energy. If we couldn't store energy, we couldn't survive. What this tells you, of course, is that because energy storage is conserved across a broad range of species, it means that it's an extraordinarily powerful mechanism. And I'm gonna show you in a minute, not only is it a powerful mechanism for storing energy, it has extraordinarily powerful mechanisms for protecting that energy. In other words, for making it difficult to lose body fat once you've acquired it. Makes, uh, makes perfect sense. Camel, of course, is a good example. It stores its body fat uh, in a, uh, on its, its hump. Um, it's actually a, you know, a, a wonderful uh, uh, mechanism for storage. Broad range of species do the same thing. Whales, of course, have this blubber uh, you know, just beneath the skin, which it's, it's required uh, to survive. So there's nothing new here. Uh, this, is, this is what we want to have happen. Evolution operated very specific, 
uh, specifically on a broad range of species to lead to the evolution of these mechanisms for, sh for storing energy. Uh, there's lots of ways in which different species store uh, body fat. This one comes from a, a cow. It just happens to be the muscle tissue of uh, cows raised in Kobe, Japan. I'm sure some of you have had some of this. In fact, some of the best wagyu around is from Australia. Uh, and the uh, animals that are raised uh, here, you know, accumulate their body fat within the muscle. Well, humans, as it turns out, um, you know, you can see a healthy hat on, uh, a heart on the left side, but one of the places where we tend to store our body fat is around the heart muscle. You might ask why around the heart muscle? Um, well, you can actually ask why around all of our internal organs and, and exactly why it is that fat is deposited where it is. And there isn't really a great explanation for the specific location of fat, but the, the body does this remarkable job of any time you're you know, eating these uh, excess calories, it basically says, okay, I gotta put this away somewhere for future use. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, an, a, it's a rather amazing uh, mechanism. So what we do is we store body fat in various parts of the body. It makes perfect sense. It's a lot better than uh, carrying energy in the form of glycogen, uh, which is, an, you know, it's another for, uh, form of, of energy, but if you were carrying your energy on your body, it would look something like this. It's highly inefficient uh, to carry glycogen. Our bodies carry roughly 100,000 kilocalories in the form of uh, fat. You want this to happen. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's evolutionarily, uh, it, it makes perfect sense for this to happen. And the body did a great job of uh, allowing for the distribution of body fat just about anywhere uh, on, on the body. I'll describe in a minute uh, why this is important and where it is that, you're, that we're all depositing uh, body fat. So the mechanism that we've created is uh, this very simple fat cell. Now, for I'm sure we have some nutrition scientists uh, 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 in the audience, so you'll, I'll, I'll apologize for oversimplifying uh, this whole process. But basically, it's pretty simple. When we eat uh, more calories than our body needs, our body manufactures fat cells. Uh, that's a good thing. That's really exactly what, what you want to have happen. I'll describe in a minute, there's more than one kind of fat cell, but uh, for whatever reason, humans became, became really good at manufacturing white fat cells, which happen to be um, uh, good and bad. So um, once these fat cells are cre created, they don't disappear with weight loss. Um, this is also a, a brilliant mechanism that our bodies have. It's like, all right, why remanufacture something? Let's just reuse what we already have. So when you lose weight, you don't lose the fat cells. The fat cells deflate. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why when you lose the weight and then you regain it, it's a lot easier to regain it. It's like blowing up a balloon. When you blow up a balloon a second time, it's a lot easier. A third time, it's a lot easier. In other words, it becomes, it becomes easier and easier to uh, retain uh, body fat. Which was the point I was just making. All right, so um, we can't control which types of fat our bodies uh, accumulate. White fat cells uh, are the ones that most of us accumulate. I'm wearing some myself um, in various parts of, of my body, but some of us uh, accumulate uh, brown fat, which is really the better fat for, uh, for energy usage. But you can't control it, we can't control it, it's controlled by your genetics. So we have no control over that um, in particular. Now, there's a great deal of heterogeneity that exists uh, in the population, and you will, you will see various types of fat deposition among subgroups of the population. So we see that in the United States, for example. Uh, the Hispanic and black population in the United States accumulates body fat more efficiently than other subgroups uh, of the population. Um, this is sort of an example of uh, heterogeneity associated with smoking. So you should be laughing at this, right? Because uh, the lady on the right is 100 year old, year, years old smoking cigarettes. I can tell you, by the way, the longest person in the uh, longest lived 
person in the world was a woman by the name of Jeanne Calmon from southern France who made it to 122. She smoked for 100 years. Now, what that tells you is, it shouldn't tell you, by the way, that smoking is a good thing and that it's going to make you live long. Uh, it, what it tells you is, is that there are subgroups of the population for whom smoking is not a risk factor. It's the same thing with, with body fat. There are subgroups of the population that can make it out to older ages carrying excess body fat. Actually, as it turns out, excess body fat among those who make it out to older ages is actually healthy. It actually lowers uh, the risk. In, in fact, I actually have, have an interesting story. I don't know if I told you this, Robin, but uh, when my mother was 85 uh, years old, we were out to dinner with my dad, who was 90, and uh, you know, every single meal, she would turn to us and she, she would say, yeah, you know, I better watch what I'm eating. I need to lose a little weight. You know, she said, what do you think, Jay? Right? I'm a professor of public health. So you might have ordinarily expected me to say, yeah, sure, you need to lose some weight. I said, no, mom. I said, look, I said, if obesity uh, or excess body fat was an issue for you, you'd be dead already. I said, you're a subgroup of the population that clearly benefits from having excess weight. And so enjoy your dessert. Just don't, <laughs> just don't do it in excess. Uh, it was a fairly simple message, and it was a huge weight off of her shoulder. She's going, wow, I get to really enjoy the, the, the things that I, that, I, that I eat. And it was a very powerful but simple uh, message. Now, it's a somewhat different message for people at younger uh, ages, but once you've made it out to older ages, you're a member of this subgroup of the population that actually benefits from carrying excess weight. So where the body fat is stored is influenced by genetics. You have no control over that at all. I wish we could. I wish there was a switch we could turn on and off that would you know, locate where the fat goes. And actually, I'd much rather have a switch that I could influence on where it comes off. Um, but unfortunately, we can't, do, we can't do that. And where you happen to store your fat is associated with a specific range of diseases and disorders that are expressed later in life. So if you store your body fat in, I guess this, this works here, but it's not showing up over there. So if you store your body fat in the upper half of your body, it is directly associated with an elevated risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension. There's a whole suite of diseases and disorders that are associated with body fat accumulated in the upper half of your body. In the lower half of your body, uh, it's associated with mechanical issues. Unfortunately, you can't control where that fat is being deposited. Uh, but it is directly associated with late life uh, events. Now, here's where, where fat becomes very insidious. So when you accumulate body fat, the body fat becomes a secreting organ. It communicates. It has the ability to communicate with your brain. I guarantee all of you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you try to lose weight, your body very carefully and effectively will give you a headache. Um, I'm sure you've experienced this. It will make you hungry. You'll experience a, a certain type of pang in your stomach. There's a number of mechanisms through which your body fat communicates with your brain to say, stop, don't get rid of me. I'm here for a reason. I'm here for a, for a very good reason. This is an extraordinarily powerful mechanism for the body fat to protect itself. So that's referred to as defending uh, fat storage. It's extraordinarily uh, efficient at it. It's uh, one of the main reasons why it's so difficult uh, to lose weight once uh, we've acquired it. Um, it. We used to think that the hormone that was communicating with the brain uh, leptin was telling us, yeah, uh, we're full. No, actually, it's not true. It's basically a starvation signal saying, stop trying to remove fat from my body. Again, this is an evolutionary adaptation. It evolved in, our, in us and a broad range of other species a long time ago. It is not easy to battle against our own genetics in this way. Uh, and then the cell signals that we get um, include psychological depression when you, when you try to lose weight. So, the, you know, it's an insidious uh, organ, this body fat, uh, and it works extraordinarily effectively. 
So um, you may remember, I don't know if it, how much any of you are familiar with this literature on caloric restriction, but we know from years of research that reducing caloric intake can extend life for a broad range of species. And there was a research scientist by the name of Roy Walford, who I knew uh, years ago, who claimed that if you reduced your caloric intake dramatically, that we could all live to 120. Uh, I actually had a conversation with him in his early 70s, a few years before he died, uh, uh, asking him whether he actually really thought that we could all live to 120 if we dramatically reduced our caloric intake. And he said, well, privately, no. Uh, but then when he would meet with the media, he would say, yeah, sure, we can all live to 120 if we, we reduce our, our caloric intake. So the, it was later discovered that this caloric, this uh, caloric restriction, or CR, was not what we thought it was. We used to think that if you lose weight, it extends life, or it allows you to lose weight more effectively. No, it actually doesn't work that way. The animal models that were done, uh, the animal uh, studies that were done in these uh, other species, used as the control animals, animals that were fed ad libitum. Ad libitum is sort of like how we eat. You eat as much as you want, um, when, whenever you want. And so the control animals became Fat, like the one in the upper right-hand corner there. That was the frame of reference. Then when they reduced the caloric intake among uh, another subgroup of mice, they noticed that the subgroup with the caloric restriction lived longer and healthier lives. As it turns out, th this was not a demonstration of the health benefits of caloric restriction. It was a demonstration of the harmful effects of gluttony, of eating too much and storing too much body fat. It also illustrated, by the way, the value of what's called intermittent fasting. I don't know how much you've discussed this. As it turns out, my whole family is doing intermittent uh, fasting. For those of you who aren't familiar, it's basically consuming your calories over an eight hour or so, eight to 10 hour time period, and then not consuming calories for the rest of that time period. Actually, the uh, CR animals were only fed once a day. So the health benefits weren't associated so much with caloric restriction. It was associated with the fact that they had to wait 24 hours to eat. And I can tell you, by the way, in my case, a lot of the health issues that I've had throughout my life uh, disappeared completely uh, when I started controlling the timing of when I ate and what I ate. So when we ate dinner last night, that was really late for me. I normally stop eating at about 5 o'clock. Um, which is why I wasn't eating all that much uh, last night. All right, nutrition science. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Everyone here should be familiar with this. These are some of the mistakes that were made. Uh, no offense to the nutrition scientists here, but it's not already anything you don't already know. Um, here's an example of what we were told back in 1942. Uh, it was basically, yeah, eat all of these foods, but my favorite is the line on the bottom. In addition to the basic seven, eat anything else that you want. <laughs> yeah, really bad advice. Um, 1942. This is 1970. Boy, did they get it wrong. Um, this pyramid was really bad advice. And the folks that followed this bad advice accumulated calories faster than they probably uh, should have. Well, it didn't change much. Here's uh, 1992. The exact same message, load us up with carbohydrates. Uh, that's, you know, six to, if we ate six to 11 servings of, of carbohydrates, no wonder our bodies are, are accumulating fat at, at an accelerating rate. Here's 2005. I honestly have no clue what this is. <laughs> this, I, I, don't, I don't even know how they, who came up with this concept about the only thing that makes sense to me is the stair climbing on the left side. Um, this, was, this was horrible. Uh, this is the, you know, one of the more recent ones because everybody thinks about what you actually put on your plate. Uh, and they were just basically saying, all right, yeah, let's just make it simple. This is how much should, you know, on your plate should, be, should have vegetables and fruit and protein and, and, uh, and whatnot. There's nothing here, by, by the way, about timing, about when you should be eating. And when it comes time to the program that you eventually develop, I'm, I'm going to make some suggestions about influencing the timing with which uh, we eat because it's actually critically important. 
So there was this confluence of events that happened in the 1970s, and this actually is what led to the conclusion that I came to in that 2005 paper, and it's exactly uh, why we saw what we saw happen in the United States. And this should sound familiar. I don't know exactly the circumstances that have happened here, but I'm gonna show you what happened in the United States uh, and, and all the mistakes that we had made along the way. So um, first of all, we, we, we introduced um, all of these wonderful sources of sugar, uh, especially in the form of soft drinks. Oh, and by the way, we introduced them into the elementary schools and the high schools because they needed to have something to drink. Then, uh, interestingly enough, we either reduced or we eliminated the exercise programs that we had in the classrooms in the United States. I think we were, we, we were required to uh, have an exercise program. We called it gym. I don't know what you call it here, but we had gym for an hour. Right? We were burning calories like crazy. It was really a wonderful thing. They either eliminated that in the school system or they dramatically reduced it. This was my favorite. We called it recess. I don't know what you call it here, but basically let the kids out and play. Right? They run around, they burn calories. It's all good, fresh air, exercise. Um, been almost eliminated in the United States, in the elementary schools uh, and in the high schools. There's a brilliant uh, product, corn syrup, another source of sugar that we introduced into our bodies. There's the American lunch uh, that the high school kids see or the uh, elementary school kids see. What do you expect is gonna happen? When you have these bodies that accumulate fat efficiently, doing what they're supposed to be doing, and you introduce body fat, you introduce high calorie, high fat, high sugar products to young people. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to tell you, they reduced the amount of time for lunch. It used to be, I don't know, 50 minutes to 60 minutes. Now you have to concentrate your lunch into about 20 minutes. What have we cut out? We've eliminated the signal that our body tells us that we're full. They cram that food in as fast as they can uh, during lunch. They, 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 just everything wrong that could go wrong, we did. That was one, one of the worst ones, uh, quite frankly. And then, of course, uh, mobile devices. So now, you know, back when I was a kid, uh, when we were done with dinner, they'd, you know, our parents would push us out the door and uh, they would say, come back, you know, when it gets dark. And we would just go out and play. We'd be running around constantly. Now, the kids nowadays, um, you know, are sitting back playing on their computers, their phones. It's, it's, it's all, I mean, it's all balancing calories. It should be obvious what's going on here. Oh, and then of course, um, you, you, you heard the, uh, uh, the former uh, health minister, what did he call himself, the, the bloke who used to be the health minister? You heard him, him say, yeah, uh, this is what he sees around him. Yeah, this is, this is our life in the United States. Look, they, they did a brilliant job. Um, they produce a large number of calories inexpensively with lots of fat and sugar. It actually tastes good. They know exactly how the, you know, what we like, uh, you know, and, and they were very effective uh, in introducing food, foods uh, to us that allow us to accumulate fat. Why, why is there a surprise that, that this happened? There should be no surprise whatsoever. Um, and then food deserts. Uh, interestingly enough, as I was walking over here from the hotel, um, there was a, a wonderful market on the other side of the river with lots of fresh fruits and vegetables here in an urban area. Talk about a brilliant idea, bringing healthy foods to uh, urban areas. That is it. That works beautifully as long as people uh, know about it. And once a week isn't enough, um, quite frankly. Now, this was interesting, and this is an interesting um, uh, personal experience. My parents were, uh, they grew up during the Depression era. So if your parents were in the Depression era, they saw food in a different way than the rest of us. For them, they didn't always have access to food. So when they had access to food, they had to consume all of it. What they taught us uh, as children uh, was 
to become a member of the Clean Plate Club, which some of you might remember, which is if there's anything on your plate, you have to empty it in your body. Uh, even if you're full, you still have to eat it. It was a horrible mistake. My, you know, our, I don't blame our, our parents for, for doing that. That's what, what they were told. It was part of the Depression era mentality. I understand completely. But you have this generational effect of the parents influencing the children uh, and the types of calories that they're, they're consuming. And I can tell you that, that I have this conversation with my own kids who have their kids. So I have two grandsons and they are very careful to not feed the grandchildren more when they're not hungry. It's like, all right, when they're not hungry anymore, stop feeding them. Pretty simple concept, right? Well, that wasn't the case uh, in our parents' generation. Oh, and then, of course, we had the brilliant idea of replacing butter with trans fats. Wow, what a great idea. Um, and, and our this, this was, our, and I don't blame my parents for that. That's what they were told to do. They were trying to protect us uh, to, get, to get, get the butter out and bring in the trans fats. They didn't know that trans fats were unhealthy. They were doing what they, they were supposed to be doing. So we get all these mixed messages, which we have to be very careful about. And it's part of what, in the end, you're going to have to be very cautious about, is getting rid of these mixed messages. Here, eggs is a classic example. They're bad for you. They're good for you. They're bad for you. They're good for you. Who are you supposed to believe? Well, guess what? They're going to have to you're going to have to get the story straight. You're going to have to get it right and communicate it effectively to the parents and the kids on what we know and what we, we don't know. This is the latest, by the way, uh, the one on the right. <laughs> so, All right. Um, am I correct here that I only have four minutes left? <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Let me, <laughs> let, me, let me go through this a little bit faster because it's the end part that I, that on life expectancy that I want to get to. This isn't anything that all of you don't already know about. This is the relationship between things that happen early in life and late in life. So sun exposure early in life uh, causes cancer. Actually, ironically enough, I had a cancer removed from my own head just about six months ago as a result of a, a sun exposure that I had when I, when I was young. Classic example of developmental programming, early life, late life events. Uh, tobacco consumption, lung cancer, uh, chicken pox and shingles. Um, incidentally, uh, I, I really honestly have no idea what COVID is going to do to us, uh, but it's likely to do something. Uh, and usually it's not good. Uh, alcohol consumption and liver disease. Uh, adverse childhood experiences uh, can have a pretty dramatic effect on health issues later in life. Epigenetics, I could actually do a whole hour on epigenetic programming, but basic, and I don't know if anyone's talking about this over the next uh, day or so, but basically this is a story about how uh, one generation and how healthy you are during the time in which you conceive a child can influence the health status of the child when they are born. Um, that's a longer story, but it is a conversation I had with both with my daughter and my daughter-in-law uh, in particular about uh, this concept of epigenetics. I'm going to pass by that. So look, I'm, I'm not going to uh, be belabor this. Early life uh, accumulation of body fat contributes to late life disease. We know what the relationship is between them, and we know that if you can avoid that early life body fat, that you can lower the risk of a broad, ranges, broad range of uh, diseases and disorders. Uh, this is uh, called the Golden Cohort. These were people born in the 1930s and 40s in the UK. Are you familiar with this? It's sort of a classic example of, um, of this relationship between early life and late life events. We think that this cohort in the UK was calorically restricted in the post-World War II era, and when they made it to later adulthood, they experienced health benefits associated with it. Classic example of developmental uh, programming. So, uh, yeah, I guess I have two minutes to discuss this, but, but this actually is a fairly straightforward uh, story. I've served on the advisory board of a number of companies 
uh, the Social Security Administration in 2002. PepsiCo actually put me on their advisory board to help them develop healthy foods for older individuals, ironically enough. They don't, don't really produce a whole lot. In fact, they produce a lot of those sugary substances that I showed you earlier. And then about six weeks ago, I testified before Congress on issues associated with aging. I don't think I'm going to be able to get to that. But way back in 2002, when I was serv serving as an advisor to the Social Security Administration, they showed me this figure. And they said, this is our projection of life expectancy at age 65 uh, and at birth. And what is this? This is a linear increase uh, in life expectancy. And I said uh, politely, this isn't going to happen. And I said, the reason it isn't going to happen is because you seem to be unaware of the fact that we have an obesity epidemic here in the United States that is going to influence the health and longevity of future generations. And they said to me, well, all right, uh, how much of an impact is it going to have? That is what led to the New England Journal of Medicine article that I published in 2005. Uh, let me pass by this because this is important. If you want to understand what the health status of a generation is going to be, if you want to know what people 65 and older are going to be like health-wise in the future, you don't look at the previous health status of people that were 65 last year, five years ago, 10 years ago. That's a different generation. What you do is you go down the age structure and you look at the health status of people that will be age 65, 10, 15, 20 years from now. It's something that you could see. This was the message I was conveying to the Social Security Administration. I can already tell you that this generation is in trouble. And that's what we ended up demonstrating in that, uh, in that article. Well, guess what? I went looking for the same information here in Australia and found it. The exact same linear extrapolation of life expectancy is being done here. No offense if the folks are in the room here that did this. This is a mistake. This is not going to happen uh, in Australia. This is linear extrapolation thinking. And for the reasons that I just told you and the reasons that I told you, that I told the Social Security Administration a few years ago, it can't happen. We could see it by looking at the health status of younger, uh, younger generations. The, um, so this is the article that we published in 2005. This is what actually happened to life expectancy in the United States. Now, back in 2005, I predicted it would take 10 years for life expectancy to slow down and even reverse. We were going to ex actually experience a decline. Boy, nobody liked that message. They really hated that, that message. And I said, well, there's something we can do about it. But right now, we can see the poor health status of these younger, younger generations, and they're going to carry those elevated health risks with them as they grow older through that age structure. It shouldn't be a surprise uh, that this is going to happen. And, and um, COVID, of course, came in and, and wreaked additional havoc, but that's not why this happened. And obesity wasn't the only thing that contributed to this, by the way. Um, we had problems in the United States with uh, drug use uh, as well, uh, opioids that contributed to this. So I think I'm, oh, actually, I'm going to end with these slides right here, because this is what Australia did uh, in 2005 when I did my interviews uh, here. So... This came out like within a week of, um, of that story breaking here in Brisbane. So you have Sesame Street here in Australia, and I got word that uh, the, ma the people that created Sesame Street changed the C from, from cookie to calorie. So they were, they, I don't know how, how long that lasted. Uh, I haven't watched Sesame Street here in Australia, so I, I don't know if it's still going on, but it was a brilliant uh, approach. To, to, to communicating to kids that, that maybe we should be concerned about uh, calories. And then this also was, they didn't do this in the United States, only in Australia. The fundraising approaches shifted from selling sweets, you know, chocolate and cookies and whatnot, to uh, alternative ways of, of fundraising that didn't require selling fat and sugar to kids. Um, only in Australia, it didn't, did not happen in the United States. 
Um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation shortly thereafter invested a half a billion dollars in efforts to combat uh, excess calories in children. So there was a lot of money that, that came into this. And then uh, Michelle Obama based her uh, uh, Play 60 campaign on that one sentence in our New England Journal of Medicine uh, article. So you're in a unique position here. You have the ability to influence uh, an entire generation of people that have already accumulated body fat, and it's gonna be difficult, uh, but it's doable to help that generation live a healthier, more productive life. But importantly, it's also possible to influence future generations. And that, I think, is something that we're gonna talk about during our discussion in a little, in a little, little while. So I'm gonna stop there. I apologize for going over. Thank you so much for your attention.